Hi, I'm Jennifer Stein. Welcome to Radnor Studio Channel 21's program for Mainline MUFON. I'm the host of Mainline MUFON and I'm very happy to have a very special guest here today. It's Peter Robbins. I'd like to give the listening audience a little background about Peter, so bear with me while I read some of his extensional credentials. I should say um, extensive credentials. For 35 years, Peter Robbins has been a respected researcher, investigator, writer, lecturer, activist, dedicated to the serious study of the UFO phenomenon. He has co-authored a British best-selling book called Left at East Gate, a first-hand account of the Rendlesham Forest UFO incident, its cover-up, and its investigation. He is also author of a recently published online book called Deliberate Deception, a case of disinformation in the UFO research community. Peter has lectured all over the world for national and international conferences and seminars at public and private secondary schools, universities, businesses, libraries, and scientific organizations and educational foundations, including the Cambridge Hospital in Boston for the late Pulitzer Prize winning writer and professor and psychiatrist Dr. John Mack, just to mention one of several dozen universities, conferences, and organizations that span the globe that Peter has spoken at. He was also the longtime assistant to pioneer abduction researcher Bud Hopkins, who was also an author on this topic. And he, Peter was a founding board member of the Hopkins Intruders Foundation. Peter was a research assistant on the United Nations Secretary General's 1978 report for the establishment of a UN UFO department. He was an editorial assistant to the Blue Memorandum for Parliament's House of Lords in 1980 for their debate on UFOs. When Steven Spielberg's miniseries Taken was being released, Peter was hired to help promote the release of this film as or of this miniseries as the event coordinator for the sci-fi channel symposium called Alien Abduction Phenomenon. He was a writer, planner, and commentator on the Ultimate UFO 2 DVD set collection of UFO footage, and he appeared in numerous documentaries on the topic of UFOs, including my DVD production called The Disclosure Dialogues, which airs on this network. And he is the associate producer and narrator for an upcoming film, which I am producing, called Travis. It's the background story about Travis Walton and his UFO incident in 1975. And I'm co-producing this with another local Philadelphian named Bob Terrio. Peter was was the web watch and an assistant columnist for UFO magazine. And he has written for Fate magazine, Phenomenon magazine, UFO data magazine in the UK, RJ Journal of UFO Studies in Japan, to name just a few. And he is currently the American correspondent for a UK publication called UFO Truth magazine. He was an advisor and a consultant to many, many UFO conferences around the world, including McMinnville, Oregon's UFO Festival, the city of Roswell, New Mexico, as well as their public relations representative and media li liaison, conference coordinator, and a consultant on UFO-related tourism in Roswell. And he is the co-founder of the Exeter, New Hampshire UFO Conference, the New England UFO Conference, and coming up shortly, a Lemonster, Massachusetts UFO Conference. His television appearances are also numerous. He's been on The Early Show on CBS, The History Channel, Britain's Roswell, Unsolved Mysteries, Good Day New York, The O'Reilly Factor, People Are Talking, which is filmed right here in Philadelphia, Philly Live, the Real Roswell National Geographic Channel, Sci-Fi Channel's featured documentary, UFO Invasion at Rendlesham, L'Odyssée de la Tranche in France, the network's first UFO paranormal witness, Lifetime Television in Canada, as well as shows for Chilean and Norwegian national television, and French-Canadian television, and numerous BBC TV affiliates. His radio appearances are also extensive. He's been on Coast to Coast with George Norrie, The Art Bell Show, 
Hieronymus Company in Baltimore, Wake Up USA in New Orleans, Sightings on the Radio with Jeff Rents, The James Whale Show in London, The Alan Colm Show in New York City, Laura Lee Show in Oregon, Eye to Eye in Arizona, Beyond R Reality in Rhode Island, Strange, a BBC World Service in Iran, Columbia University Radio in New York City, and WBAI New York's UFO Desk, Strange Days Indeed with Errol Bruce Knapp in Toronto, The Jerry Pippin Show, UFOs Fact, Fiction, or Fantasy, the BBC World Service, and the James Hunt Hour, KJNC in Texas, Through the Keyhole in Rochester, New York, and numerous BBC affiliates. I'm terribly honored to have Peter here in Philadelphia to be speaking for Mainline MUFON, to be here at Radnor Studio 21. And today we are going to be talking about a presentation Peter's giving here in Philadelphia, and it's on Wilhelm Reich. And I'd like to welcome you officially, Peter, after that lovely and extensive long introduction. And for the listening audience who may not really know who Wil Wil Wilhelm Reich is, I'd like you to first tell us how you came and stumbled upon Wilhelm Reich's work. <coughs> and then we'll start to talk about him. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. It's wonderful to be back at Radnor Studio 21. And um, Dr. Reich is probably, for me, one of the greatest scientific minds and social thinkers of the last few millennia. Uh, his work is so disturbing to um, the status quo that even to this day, and he's been gone now for over 50 years, it is still uh, almost irrationally um, distorted, demeaned, put down, and ignored, but its potential contributions to humanity cannot be underestimated. I became involved in his work when I was still a teenager um, as a freshman at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut and uh, my roommate came back from either a Christmas or a Thanksgiving vacation and told me that he had read two extraordinary books and that I had to read them uh, and one of them was Wilhelm Reich's um, character analysis which is perhaps the only book that conventional studies in psychology and psychiatry will recommend to students with the caveat that you can ignore everything after that because he went crazy. The rumor of insanity followed him for a great deal of his life and it was generated from a number of sources, none of them really accurate. Um, but I, I read Reich's work on and off for 10 years and I learned at that point that his former first assistant who he trained to really take over the work upon his death and trained therapists to continue the therapy that he had created in the proper model was alive and well if in his seventies and still practicing and uh... he practiced out of his home in new jersey and an office on the upper east side of manhattan and i decided i wanted to meet him and um, my rationale would be, besides wanting to meet a remarkable man who I had studied and read his work and admired for years, to prepare um, some information on more contemporary UFO studies for Dr. Baker, uh, with the thought that probably he had had much too busy a schedule to keep up on it. And after some weeks of um, hounding him for a time when he could see me, I went in, I gave him my little talk, and then he looked at me and he asked me, why are you here? And I thought about it a bit and I went a little more into detail. I talked about my childhood siding with my sister and that had really made me feel kind of split in terms of uh, the way the world sees the subject. And he heard me out and he asked me again, why are you here? And he asked me several times until um, I experienced something I really never had, which was um, a profound sense of needing to really make my peace with this in a way that I was incapable on my own. And I ultimately went into therapy with him and stayed with uh, that therapy for more than six years. I have to credit the work that I did with Dr. Baker with very much helping me to become the person I became. Um, and um, 
in the course of working with him, I met a good number of people who had either worked with Reich, studied with Reich, been patients of his, an editor, his biographer, um, and became a lot more um, intimately acquainted with the work. And um, that is how my um, genesis in the work began. It's very special to, to be able to work with someone like Dr. Baker, who was a student of Wilhelm. He Reich. was his it's, first assistant for many years. That's, yeah. You really get a unique and inside perspective. You bet. So let's talk about Wilhelm Reich, um, where he was born he was, and you know how he eventually made it to the United States. Yeah. And then I, I want you to mention a little bit about his uh, relationship with Sigmund Freud, because yeah. many people don't know this about his background. Yes. Um, Wilhelm Reich was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1897. His father was a, a fairly tightly wound bureaucrat. His mother sounded like a very gentle soul. She was a piano instructor. And Reich and his brother Robert grew up on uh, an old estate and surrounded by nature and growing up observing natural functioning of animals and plants in their most intimate form. Um, and were privately educated by tutors. Come World War I, um, he enlisted in the Austro-Hungarian Army and served with distinction as an artillery officer. At the end of the war, however, the estate was gone, the old world was vaporized, and he was penniless. But he possessed a brilliant mind and uh, made his way to Vienna where he studied medicine supporting himself over those years, tutoring other students. One of the things that drew him to Vienna was the work of this man, uh, this doctor, uh, Sigmund Freud. And it must have been a very exciting time to be a young medical student. And ultimately, when he became a physician and left school, he presented himself to Freud, uh, was accepted to learn the method that Freud was pioneering, and became part of Freud's inner circle. His brilliance and inquisitiveness distinguished him very early on, and Freud made him his assistant, and he remained in that position until about 1929, continuing to be a Freudian psychotherapist in the method, again, that Freud had pioneered. They split in 1929 because... Um, uh, depending on whether you um, read Fre Reich's marvelous book called Reich on Freud, or you um, access the records within the, Freudian, uh, the Freud archives in Vienna, you will so see two different very pictures. Um, Reich ultimately went to Freud, and there's always a very formal relationship between them. Even after six years, it was always Dr. Reich and Dr. Freud. And what he said in so many words was after six years of working in your method, my um, results bear out that literally all of the dysfunction, the neuroses, the pathology, the problems that people have in life, no matter how disguised they are in a work-related problem or something else, that it has a basis in sexual stasis, unhappiness or uh, a lack of any meaningful sex life. Now Freud of course had pioneered the notion that much if not a good part of human problems are rooted with sexual causes but to say that literally all human problems were rooted in this was a bit much for Freud, more than a bit, and certainly for uh, Victorian uh, Vienna at the time. It was also antithetical to what the Freudians felt to be the case. And rather than continue on as a pioneering Freudian psychotherapist, they parted ways. The original um, rumors, myth, legend of Reich's mental unhinging began with the Freudians, who felt that the fact that he was in this privileged position as Freud's assistant and uh, very much a favorite of Freud's in many respects, and to walk away from it was obviously a sign of mental instability. Um, at that time, the so-called scientific socialist experiment in Europe 
what we call communism uh, in, of course, in the Soviet Union, in part taking place in Germany and Austria, had set up clinics around those three countries to assist workers with health problems. Um, Reich, at the request of the Communist Party, began to um, oversee and uh, reestablish these clinics as what he called sex poll clinics, sexuality and politics. And his aim was to restore, wherever possible, some kind of meaningful, as he would say, sexual equilibrium, a happy, healthy sex life in the lives of factory workers. The idea being that, you know, a happy worker would be a more productive worker and, uh, you know, uh, more for moving world communism forward. However, uh, much to, uh, I'll say disappointment, but probably more the horror of the communists overseeing these um, clinics was as Reich, with his methodology, was able to help these couples either establish for the first time or reestablish a happy, healthy, intimate life, their first priority no longer was the good of the party. Their first priority was their family, their personal happiness, their love for their partner, their love for their children, and that was not okay. And he was expelled from the party, well, depending on the account, or left it and became a very vocal and avowed anti-communist for the rest of his life which led the communists by 1933 to say, well, you know, uh, Dr. Reich is crazy. How do we know he's insane? Um, he left the party. Um, he puts, you know, personal pleasure above uh, the good of, um, you know, equality in the world, etc. He managed to get out of Austria literally just before the doors slammed shut and Hitler consolidated power in Germany and emigrated to Norway, where he worked for the next few years, primarily um, developing his therapeutic model and also um, working in trying to establish whether or not, and it was certainly turned out to be the case, that there were non-environmental factors involving cancer formation and that in certain cases, um, cancers could go into remission if the energetic functioning in the body could be brought up to a certain point again. By 1939, he was contacted by um, the administrators for the New School for Social Research in New York City and invited to emigrate to the United States and teach there, which he did. Um, he established a residence in Queens, New York, uh, a county, a borough of New York City. And for the next years, really pioneered a lot of much of what is now uncredited kind of godfather to a great deal of the human potential movement and body work. Um, what he was able to establish, and this is truly pioneering, is that certain traumas are literally caught up in the musculature and that they become chronic. They affect the way we breathe, they affect the way you hold yourself. They affect our attitudes. And if in the therapy that he offered, which was unlike Freudian therapy, which is based on living in the head and intellectual rapport and talk, talk, talk with your therapist, this was real work. Um, you would lie on a chaise lounge, you would kick, you would pound, you would scream. And the therapist, and he insisted, I think with one exception in his whole career, that his... Um, therapists or organomists, as he called them, from the name he gave to the science. And I should say here, a lot of people um, who don't know any better, who the work makes uneasy, will find a, a way to poke fun at the terminology that he created. The science of organomy obviously has its root in the word organism or orgasm, depending on your interpretation. And it's simply the study of how energy functions in the living and non-living realm. So it cuts across every single scientific discipline. But there is that common functioning principle. But one of the things that was established in this therapy, and I know because I experienced it, was at certain points, as these memories are starting to rise to the surface, deep tissue work will release chronic contractions, and that memory comes roaring back 
and you may experience the trauma you've put off for decades or that you experienced decades ago and were armoring around. And in fact, at that point, it's to the surface enough that you can begin to talk about it. So that brings us up to uh, the later 1940s in his work. I um, had the pleasure of reading some of your presentation for tonight, and I um, was impressed to learn that he actually had um, a relationship, at least for a short period of time, with uh, Albert Einstein. He did. And it was through his study of organomy and what he, he created a generating machine to generate... Um, what was the term? Not ozone? Well, or... what it was, um, in, by 1939-1940, um, Dr. Reich had, in a laboratory setting, established a, an energy, a, a recognition of an energy that's always been there, of course, that he called orgone energy. Orgone energy. Right. It's nothing new in that, by some interpretations, um, Hindu texts would refer to it as the prana, uh, the Victorians referred to a manifestation of it in their minds as the ether. ether right. And for Reich, the problem was that in the mystical tradition, it was mystified. The Victorians mecha mechanized their view of it, and he saw it in completely organic terms. He was able to um, show it as a real thing in a vacuum tube that glowed blue under the proper circumstances, and developed such an exceedingly simple device that people today still talk about it as though it were a joke and have some nasty slang about it. He called it a um, orgone accumulator. And it is very simply composed of layers of inorganic and organic material. It could be as big as a small shoebox, and it's alternating layers of organic and inorganic material. The organic layer holds energy. It attracts and holds energy. The metallic layer reflects it. It doesn't hold it. So if you have an accumulator that's, say, six-fold, three layers of each, within that space, um, I did experiments when I was young, um, and many you, you can do these experiments yourself. There's not a tremendous amount of apparatus or money that needs to be expended to prove to yourself the reality of his claims. Um, I used one at one point for seed germination to charge plant seeds and then see whether they grew differently, and they did. Um, however, the accumulator that most people are most familiar with, even if not directly from popular culture, is one that's about the size of a small phone booth that fits one person. And I've used them on and off since I was 20 or so. And again, depending on the number of layers, you experience um, within a few minutes, if you're not a heavily armored person, um, quite a charge in your system. Uh, if it's completely dark, you'll see little, what he called spinning waves, just these little dots of light spinning that many of us would be told were illusionary or your imagination or something, but it's a manifestation of energy. Um, if you stay it in one too long, you'll feel exhausted, really drained. And if you have an apparatus with like a length of empty BX cable coming back out of it and a small metal funnel, you can actually use it to direct your attention on certain areas. For example, um, at one point, I had one when I lived down in lower Manhattan that I would, if I had a sore throat, I would simply spend, you know, 10 minutes twice a day or something holding it a few inches away from my throat while I was reading or something. And we know the rate at which we heal. Um, I would always come around quicker. The other thing was, you know, you burn yourself on a pan in the kitchen or something without any antiseptic or anything, but the same procedure, the burn would clear up much quicker, much quicker than it would normally. And they're sometimes referred to in a scurrilous way as orgone boxes, and in terms that are meant to be derogatory. They work, they're absolutely authentic, and they're based on very solid scientific thinking, if not widely acknowledged by the establishment scientific community. Yes, I'm aware that there are many naturopaths and alternative healers that are developing these and using them, but they 
they couch them in different names um, and with uh, different modalities that they claim they've developed, but in actuality they're, they're using a version of the organ generator. They are, and again, he, um, he pioneered so much of what is now considered alternate healing uh, techniques. Also, unlike so much of uh, the movement that we see today, Reich genuinely felt, and I think with good cause, that organized religion per se was not really a friend of the people. It was fraught with controlling people, with generating fear, um, with um, mystical longing. If you do this in this life, this will happen to you in the next life. So he was very anti-organized religion and very un-mystical, which tended to keep certain very decent people who go to church on Sunday or synagogue on Saturday or the mosque or whatever, away from his work because that was another aspect they were uncomfortable with. There was another area that he was an amazing pioneer um, in developing a piece of equipment that could alter weather patterns, and this was known as a cloud buster. So mm. I'd like you to talk a little bit about this work, describe what it looks like, and explain to our audience how that related to UFOs and yeah. what his discoveries were. Reich's connection with the subject of UFOs uh, was extremely well-grounded, scientifically documented, multiply observed, scrupulous scientific records taken, but all that be damned. Uh, the fact that this scientist who, at that point, the FDA, uh, our Federal Drug Administration, which in the 40s and 50s was really run by a bunch of thugs in government. Um, all they knew was that his pronounced interest in human sexuality, that he was likely some kind of sexual predator or quack. And you didn't need any more information on him. And certainly the FDA, to the best of our knowledge, never once rep even tried to replicate one of his experiments, because had they done so and it turned out properly, well, that would undermine their case they didn't need any other information. They knew he was a problem and he had to be brought down. And the simplicity of this apparatus, like the um, orgone accumulator, most people, if they've been exposed to hearing about it, they discount it sight on scene with the simple mantra that we can apply to uh, the way a lot of people perceive UFOs. It can't be. Therefore, it isn't. Therefore, it must be something else. What he observed in the early 50s um, was that, very simply put, metal grounded in water in the right configurations tended to be an attractor. Now, the best two examples I can give you before going into the particulars that I were a part of my childhood, and I think a lot of people's in various ways, if me or my sisters or my cousins were visiting my nana, uh, my wonderful Russian grandmother, and you had a cut or a boil or a pimple or something, her remedy, so to say, or her way of dealing with it would be she'd cut a potato in half, and you'd simply hold that half a potato, and all you knew as a kid was that it was cooling, it felt better, and that was that. In fact, the natural living energy in that potato was literally drawing the toxin, the, you know, the, the infectant in the pimple to the surface, speeding in it to come to crisis, you know, a rupture and begin to heal up at a quicker rate. Some years after that, when I was in the Boy Scouts, and this is just standard advice when you're out, you know, in the woods, if a bee sting or another kind of um, animal uh, insect bite or something is causing you irritation, you put some mud on it. Same thing. It feels better. It's cool. The pain dissipates. Mud has a living energy too. And it also draws to the surface. Oh, yeah. Now with that understood, what he worked out was, and this was at a time in the early 50s, when southern Maine, the area that he lived in at the time, a beautiful area around Rangeley, Maine, um, was caught up in a drought, a regional drought. And he developed a simple apparatus. It was made of long metal pipes in two arrays above and below. Let's say a simple cloud buster could be four pipes, four pipes, 
but the back of each pipe was attached to, um, you know, the BX cable that snakes through our house with wiring in it for electricity. Pull out the wiring and you have a flexible metal cable. Uh, industrial BX is considerably larger and he walk, worked with pipes that were the same circumference as industrial BX. Attached very long lengths of empty industrial BX, put the whole thing on an armature that could be adjusted up and down side to side, either manually or ultimately by some kind of remote control, because a cloudbuster in operation puts out uh, a certain irritant, a toxicity that makes it uncomfortable to be around, and if you are around it too much, you will get sick. You know, you'll, it'll feel like a sore throat, a cold, flu, but you will get sick. And what he did was the ends of the BX cable were dumped in a well or in um, a river or stream of moving water, a lake or a pond. The water was the ultimate attractor. It acted as a grounding. And what it did was create movement in the atmosphere where energetically it was drawn down to the pipes. Now, you do that long enough and you'll create, with a, a large enough cloudbuster, genuine movement in the atmosphere. And so, a logical thinker, he began by aiming the cloudbuster in an easterly direction over the Atlantic. And by day, he would adjust the elevation. And what happened was after a while, gradually, and it could be charted every day, the relative humidity index in the air increased. It kept increasing until there was enough that it rained. And it rained enough that that drought was broken. And you could have put a compass point um, on Rangeley, Maine and spun it out X number of miles in any direction. And that area, the drought was no longer there. Now, the shock for him was once he started using a cloudbuster in this manner, UFOs started appearing over that part of southern Maine, and in particular over the Rangeley area. Now, this sounds like madness. It sounds like bad science fiction, except that it was multiply witnessed. They weren't there when he wasn't working. They were there when he was. And on October 10th, I believe, 1954, um, or 53, I'll double, have to double check it, he decided to undertake um, an experiment that really changed his perception of the world around us, and, and <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and the perceptions of anyone else that really takes the time to study the literature, which was he aimed the cloudbuster at a UFO. And what he observed was within a, a very short period of time, it dimmed, it, it pulsated, it wobbled, and it either disappeared ultimately or flew away. He did it repeatedly and the same thing happened with UFOs. Ultimately he published around this, although the book did not come out till shortly after he died, uh, a book called Contact with Space which records all of the early weather work and very in every strict scientific method uh, as well as the observations, deductions and conclusions about UFOs. Once he had established that this device genuinely worked, he felt it was imperative that field tests be undertaken that for establishment science would have real weight and gravitas. And so he and his colleagues did a study and tried to establish what was the most rain-starved portion of the United States. It was probably Death Valley, but it was impractical to get cloudbusters down there. But they found an area, at least an area, of some acres outside of Tucson, Arizona. And they trucked across country to Cloudbusters. And for the latter months of 1954, they worked in tandem. They chose an area, as I recall, that had received about five inches of actual rainfall in 50 years. And not only did they get it to rain after a fashion, but you can actually see in their records that as the moist front was coming in from the Pacific, and this time they were drawing from several hundred miles away, so it took longer, it would rain here, it would rain here, it would rain here, uh, California, Nevada, wherever, on a gun sight line with where they were. Other things that impressed me and moved me when I, I read the original work before I had ever seen, 
a cloud-busting demonstration, which was life-changing for me, was that the mountains in the distance outside of Tucson, within everyone's memory year-round, had always had a brown hue to them. But leading up to the actual rain, there was the humidity in the air was at such a level that they were greenish in the distance for the first time. And even more dramatic, the site on the edge of the desert where they were, that they had leased, where they had the cloud busters set up, the humidity index had grown so strong right in that area that days before, maybe a week before it actually began to rain, dormant grass seeds that had probably been in the sand for decades began to spring up and there was prairie grass growing around the cloud busters. That Christmas, it actually snowed at Tucson Airport. It rained so hard that they caused flooding. It caused tremendous interest in the local media and among the farmers in the area who wanted Reich to stay and discuss this in furtherance. However, by that point, late 54, the um, uh, FDA had their case and um, Reich had to return to Maine to deal with it. Um, but that is the basics of cloud busting and the technology behind it. It's absolutely fascinating. It's, uh, it's sort of like an accumulator, just like the organ machine that he uh, established as well. well so he was, he was a real student of nature, and he understood the natural flow of energy yeah. and the accumulation of energy and the importance of energy, not only in the human body, but in every living system. Well, you're not only right, Jennifer. One of, um, for me, the most brilliant um, things that he established was not just a common functioning principle about how energy functions and about how energy blockages create problems for everything from an amoeba to a human being to a weather front to the formation of galaxies, but that there was a common functioning principle that governed everything from an amoeba splitting to um, humans or animal orgasm to how a storm comes on us, manifests itself, and then resolves to, again, at least theoretically, and I think actually, of how star systems form, which was the simple model. Tension, as in electrical or mechanical mm -hmm. tension. Charge, again, the charge builds up. A discharge, and then relaxation. Tension, charge, discharge, relaxation. And that in your regulation issue, neurotic human being, there are blockages. The, the person who grows up totally free of, um, oh gosh, influences that will inhibit their natural loving sexuality is a very rare creature indeed. Most of us, no matter how wonderfully our parents brought us up, um, social, religious, cultural, environmental input will create conflicts, problems. Um, you see your dog hit by a car when you're seven years old and you go like that and you burst into tears. And in many cases you carry that sadness around. But that contraction becomes chronic and it does not allow you to fully experience yourself, the world around you, uh, the attitude you hold, the respiration and the way that you breathe, your ability to be a fully mobile organic creature uh, to experience great joy or great sorrow rather than hold yourself reined in to a tighter uh, parameter of emotions and expressions is part of the great tragedy of the human race. And this is really what informs our knowledge about it best. I, I don't think, I, I know I haven't personally in my entire life come upon any body of knowledge that has made me better equipped to understand the madness at play in the world at any given time and the roots of human misery as well as real human happiness. Well, I can only imagine how the world would have been a different place if people like Wilhelm Reich's uh, work would have been allowed to, to flourish and he would have been allowed to succeed and expand upon it. He died very tragically uh, in prison. He did. Uh, because he was... Uh, 
um, had a case brought against him around some of this technology, and it was a, well, a small actually, little suit. He he was uh, he was trying to sh one of his assistants was trying to ship something well, across state lines. Yeah, you know, what happened was um, the FDA worked for years from forty seven to fifty four, so trying to get one person to register a complaint about Reich, a patient, somebody who knew him in any way or had worked with any of the physicians, for psychiatrists that he had trained. Absolutely no one had ever registered a complaint about him with the FDA, with the Professional Medical Association, or with anyone else. And the best they could do was declare his accumulator, and appropriately so, an experimental medical device. And as such, um, it would be um, a misdemeanor to ship it across a state line. In a very tragic error, one of his scientists, Dr. Michael Silver, did just that. And they got him on that technicality. Reich, at the time, was finishing up the weather work in Arizona. And being a man of um, kind of extraordinary old world uh, values, who loved his adopted country in a way that only immigrants can, I, I believe, because they know the difference, no matter how patriotic we are, we don't know viscerally what it's like to not have been here. And he decided when he returned to Maine and saw the injunction and what had happened, that he would personally take responsibility of it, absolving Silvert of the need to go to court, and that he would present himself instead. And then he made um, a, a tragic error, really, so idealistic, um, he decided he would use the case as an opportunity to prove the validity of his science, and the judge would have none of it. And in fact, in the course of the going back and forth, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'll discuss it in my talk, but the misdemeanor became a single criminal charge, and he was convicted, and he was sentenced to two years in... Um, um, Actually, it's a federal prison, uh, Lewisburg, here in Pennsylvania. Um, it broke his heart, certainly. And I think he was up for parole. The, the Supreme Court refused to see it. Um, he languished in prison to a great degree. And less than a week before his scheduled release, he was found uh, dead in his prison cell. Uh, I know from Dr. Baker that... Dr. Reich had been working on a manuscript, a tremendously prolific writer. Um, I think there are more than 20 books out now by him, a number of them um, since his estate was unsealed after being sealed for 50 years. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of material that's never been published, hopefully will be over the next years. But that, that manuscript, which Dr. Baker felt was his most brilliant book, was missing from his cell when his body was found. Um, I have to discuss it in my talk because if I don't, people will ask. Were there people in power who wanted this man dead? Of course. Did they have the means to kill him overtly or covertly? Absolutely. Do I think he was murdered? No, I don't. Um, Dr. Reich had high blood pressure. He was overweight. He was a chronic smoker. He uh, preferred the diet that he grew up with, a heavy European diet. Um, to a degree, he was what we would call kind of a type A character, uh, filled with life and always moving forward. And I, I can't even imagine, I mean, it's tough enough for us to imagine what it would be like for us to be in prison, in an old-fashioned prison behind stone and steel and no freedom and no sunlight, but for somebody who had dedicated his life to literally the physiological basis of human freedom, it must have been beyond belief. So I'm more than willing to accept that he simply died, but I guess it will always be a quest open question for some people. I understand that in Maine, his estate became a museum. Yes. And for anyone who would like to get more information about Reich, they can you know, Google the museum, probably find out about it, probably yeah. go to the museum. Yeah. And um, so tell us a little bit about that museum. And yeah. you have, in fact, yourself visited it, correct? Oh, yes. I visited it a number of times. Um, 
It's called organon, again, another word taken from uh, the name that he gave the science. And it's centered around one of the most interesting structures I've ever been in. It's a building that is both was both his home and laboratory uh, with a, a small observatory on the top that doubled as a painting studio for him. He painted toward the end of his life and his work is just wonderful. Uh, very um, naive in the best sense of the word but filled with life and vitality. The Wilhelm Reich Museum is open. You definitely have to check their website or go uh, and find out one way or another but it is the home and the laboratory and the grounds in this beautiful part of southern Maine. And um, they occasionally have seminars and speakers and things. They have a good bookstore. Uh, another very important information source for anybody interested in the life and work of Reich who also would like to be able to access books by him and books about him almost all the books that I'm aware of about him are to one degree or another specious, uninformed crap. But there are some wonderful books about him. Uh, most recently, uh, a book by my dear friend, uh, Reich scholar named Jim Martin was published earlier this year called Wilhelm Reich and the Cold War. And it is absolutely brilliant. And it's such an exciting read for anybody interested in Reich or post-war American history or the lengths to which some people will go to crush individuals that can make a tremendous difference for the better in society and make us all harder to control, I'd recommend that book highly. Also, um, my friend Dr. James DeMeo, who has probably been responsible for more active cloud-busting operations than anyone ever, um, and in fact has worked under contract over the years to help break droughts, not just in this country but around the world. He operates out of a very special laboratory that's just outside of beautiful Ashland, Oregon. Uh, it's called the Orgone Biophysical Research Laboratory, or by the acronym OBRL. They have a great website, they have an extraordinary library, they have educational programs, and I think it's as fine a source as you're going to find for information on Reich with a special emphasis on um, the weather modification work. Also, Jim is the author, now in its second updated edition, of a terrific manual called the Orgone Energy Accumulator Handbook, which will allow anybody to make these or accumulator blankets or other natural therapeutic devices based on Reich's original findings and pioneering research without much problem at all. Uh, there is also an organization called the American College of Organomy, um, just outside of Princeton, New Jersey, that also has a good bookstore. Um, therapists train there, work out of that area, and um, you can find a lot of Reich's books, because none of them that I'm aware of are in print right at the moment. But if you go to um, any good used bookstore, or online. One of my favorite sites is a simple one to remember, abebooks.com, like Abe Lincoln, abebooks.com. They often have, whether it's an expensive first edition or used paperback, and uh, another great source for books on and about Reich. Wow. What a, what a journey into understanding what Wilhelm Reich had to offer. And um, it's... Um, such a shame. He, like Nikola Tesla, um, really never got to experience um, the uh, manifestation of many of the devices. I mean, he tested them, he, he had success with them, but um, he was never really acknowledged. They had to be crushed. For his work. If not, you couldn't meter power, and the 1% would not have become the 1%. Right, right. Well, um, for any of you that are uh, interested in um, hearing or seeing Peter's lecture, please look for it here on this station because we do make all of our presentations at Mainline MUFON um, available at the Radnor Studio uh, 21 channel. So um, if you'd like to see that presentation, please you know, uh, Google for it and look through uh, the station menu. I want to thank Peter uh, from the bottom of my heart for coming to Philadelphia to present and to 
be with us at Mainline MUFON and Radnor Studio. And I look forward to uh, our next show coming up soon. Thank you very much.